that I can speak. I was not told that I could speak. But I want to let you know the song that we are going to sing right now. I'd love to see you. On Thursday night, our leader was going over this song, and all of a sudden she said, anyway, Mrs. Gooden, you're going, I can't, I, I'm not a, no, 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 I can see you. But she said, no, I want you. So, I want to let you know, this is my testimony. Amen.
be in glory with that For you to be lifted high All I want is for you For you to be in glory with that For you to be lifted high Amen. 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 Will you stand with me all over God's house? Stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. Praise comes from the inside. From the inside. From the book of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 36, we find these words. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. You may be seated in God's house. As we continue our series of 
preaching and teaching entitled, There Is No Box. I'd like to tag this particular text and message for these brief moments of sharing we have together this morning. The title, Don't Be a Fan, Be a Follower. Don't Be a Fan, Be a Follower. It is Super Bowl Sunday, and I was wondering what do Browns fans and do on Super Bowl Sunday. I, I was just, I was just curious. I didn't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Let me share with you a little secret about me. For those of you that don't know, I have a love-hate relationship with the Washington football team. I, I wish they would change their name. But they haven't, and it doesn't look like they're going to. I, I've been with them since the years of Joe Theismann and Charlie Brown and John Riggins. I remember the Hogs, Dave Butts and Russ Grimm and Joe Jacoby and George Stark, Mark May. I, I remember tight end Rick Doc Walker and Don Warren. I remember as a little boy meeting Joe Jacoby, and he let me put on one of his Super Bowl rings, and I could fit three of my little fingers inside of his Super Bowl ring. I remember as a child, my daddy taking me to RFK Stadium, going down on the field in the offseason, running around on the lush green grass. I remember NFC Championship games, always beating the Cowboys in the playoffs. I remember Doug Williams and Tim Smith giving the business to the Denver Broncos in the Super Bowl to the tune of 42 to 10, and Doug Williams was the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl. I remember because I am a fan. I remember John Riggins running for over 160 yards on the Miami Dolphins to help give them their first Super Bowl in franchise history. I am a fan. I despise the Cowboys. I know it's irrational. I know it doesn't make any sense at all. I know it's crazy and silly, Aaron Brown at the same time, but I despise the Cowboys. Not because they've done anything to me at all, but simply because I'm a fan of Washington. I can't make sense of it. I always, I always want the Cowboys to lose. I want them to go 0 and 16 every year. I want their quarterback and their team to be the worst in the league because I am a fan. The word fan, if you didn't know, is short for fanatic. It implies an irrational, out of your mind person who isn't really on the team, but you got an investment in their success and their failure. Fans use terms like we. We, 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 even though they never cut you a check, uh, we, we won the game. We, we, we let y'all beat us this time. We gave y'all that game. We let you win so we could get a better draft slot. We, we, we. And Dan Snyder has never sent me one dime in my life. As a fan, I get disgusted. I've tried to pick another team. I've talked good about them. I'm open for the Browns. If the Browns got any better, maybe I would be a fan of them. I've talked bad about my team because I am a fan. And I believe that one of the problems in the church, one of the pitfalls of modern day Christianity, one of the issues of these times is I believe God has too many fans. There are too many of us that are not faithful. We are just fans. See, fans are loyal as long as you're doing something they want you to do, as long as you're giving them something. But the moment you start losing, the moment times get hard, the moment the coach makes a decision that you don't like, the moment the coach changes a strategy you ain't familiar with, fans will turn their backs on you. Oh, we stopped buying season tickets. We stopped showing up for games. And the problem is that we've treated the church just like that. Help me, Holy Ghost. We try to hold God's church hostage as if it were some business entity that we can choose to support because our theology is not a theology of democracy. One of, the, one of the issues, one of the pitfalls, one of the misconceptions about church is that church is about you, about pleasing you, about making sure that you are happy. But the truth is that the moment you join the church, here it is, here it is for me, please. The moment you give your life to Jesus, the church service and our ministry is no longer about you. Help me, Jesus. You become a servant in the kingdom. So what goes on is so other people will come down the same aisle you came down. 
And what it took to get you in here is not what it's going to take for others. So this ain't about you. You remember? Y'all remember the man begging at the gate when he got free in Jesus. He went into the temple and started witnessing the other folk. He didn't stay out there hanging out at the gate. And somebody else was going to show up at the gate and need what he needed. But the gate was no longer his place. And if we could ever stop treating God and God's church like it's some team we can stop supporting because we don't like their plays or their strategies, then we could really operate as one band with one sound. And that sound is that we're here to lead folks to Jesus the Christ. See, the real talk is that there are too many fans of God, fans who have no follow through, fans who are only faithful to God if God is blessing and bringing you out, fans who think they love their church but don't know your God, fans who are extreme, fans who are so extreme that they give God a bad name, uh, fans who are too loose, or fans who are too conservative, fans who are waiting on something to fail and something to fall, fans who wear God's jersey, we buy God's gear, but you ain't really on God's team. Fans don't train with the team, don't sacrifice with the team, but they like to complain from the sidelines uh, and try to take God's credit when, when sabotage turns into salvation and souls are really set free. The fact is God has too many fans and not enough people who follow him. Paul Powell in The Complete Disciple, he described this condition. He said, many churches today remind me of a work crew trying to gather in a harvest while they sit down together in the tool shed. He said they go to the tool shed every Sunday and they study bigger and better methods of agriculture. They sharpen their tools in the shed. They grease their tractors in the shed and then they get up and go home. <laughs> then they come back that night. They study bigger and better methods of agriculture. They sharpen their tools some more. They grease their tractors and they all pack up and go home again. Uh, they come back Wednesday night, Saturday morning, and again study bigger and better methods of agriculture, sharpen their tools, grease their tractors, get up and go home together. They do this week in and week out, year in, year out, and nobody ever decides to go into the field to gather the harvest that they were supposed to gather in the first place. Too many fans in church sitting and watching, observing, surveying, seeing, monitoring, scrutinizing, criticizing, noticing, just taking up kingdom space without offering any kingdom service. Help me. Jesus and God is calling you to move from just being a fan to really being a follower. Tabitha, affectionately known as Dorcas in the Greek language of our text, Tabitha was a show enough follower. Oh, Tabitha drops onto the scene of Acts out of nowhere and is often known more for dying and being raised for, by the Spirit of God through Peter She's gone through this life, a nameless character in the pages of scripture, but the Acts writer takes a brief moment to mention her contribution to the cause of Jesus the Christ. Uh, Tabitha, the text says, is a disciple. Uh, we're not dealing, I'm not dealing today with Tabitha's death and revival, but we want to deal today with the mark that she made as a disciple. You do know that for a woman to be named in the pages of scripture as having a memorable, lasting impression on folk who knew her is indeed an accomplishment in itself. But Tabitha is not only defined by being a woman, but she's called a disciple. She's not simply a fan of Jesus, not a bystander watching the action go by. She's not just sitting and waiting for something to fall in her lap. She's not resting in the hope that she will one day find her purpose. She's a follower, a follower who's assigned a special seat at the table, a follower who broke through gender barriers, a follower who stood against the odds of her femininity and said, yes, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. A follower who stood up to a society that would have let her use her gender as an excuse for doing nothing. She wasn't a fan, she was a follower. A uh, father and son went camping one day during the trip. The father uh, tried to teach his son how to use the North Star to find his way through the woods, but his son didn't seem to be interested in learning about the North Star. So out of frustration, the daddy said, son, pay attention to what I'm telling you so you won't get lost, son. The son looked up at his daddy and he said, daddy, I don't need to watch the stars. Uh, as long as I follow you, I will never get lost in my life. Uh, and I don't know about anybody else, uh, but I'm glad that's my testimony, that as long as I follow the father, I won't ever be lost. I, that ought to make somebody say, I don't want to just be a fan, but I want to follow God. I, I want to follow him. I can hear somebody shouting from the back that Tabitha, Tabitha helped me develop my testimony. I, oh, I hear some of the church mothers saying, Pastor, that's my testimony. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to be one of his disciples. I want to walk in the newness of life. So let me be a follower of Christ. What do I have to do? What do I have to say? How do I have to walk each and every day? 
tell me what does it cost if I have to carry the cross so let me be a follower of Christ uh, Tabitha though makes me wonder when she makes me wonder what's what's the difference between being a fan of God and then really being a follower there are three answers I promise you and I'll move on first you got to understand that fans will complain and cheer but followers take up the charge. Fans complain and cheer. All in the same, can do it out of the same mouth. And maybe sometimes we complain and cheer all in the same play. But followers take up the charge. Some 1.2 billion people in the world have absolutely no knowledge of the gospel. 1.2 billion with a B. Yet 90% of all of our evangelistic efforts are aimed at people who are already believers. 95% of all Christian activity is for the benefit of ourselves. And 99% of all Christian publishing and writing addresses topics of interest only to us. See, this is all for cheering yourself on. We, we've gotten good at cheering at ourselves and for ourselves, holding services for ourselves, ministering to ourselves. And that's fine if all you want to do is cheer, but God demands that you take up his charge. Uh, see, Tabitha took up the charge. Uh, she wasn't just cheering Jesus on. She wasn't just doing a little ministry, but the text gives her a nickname uh, and identifies her work. Uh, it says she was full of good deeds. Uh, her nickname means gazelle, uh, meaning she ran to do good deeds. Uh, and to serve others, she took up God's charge. The charge to preach good news to the poor. The charge to help the blind see. The charge to set the captive free. The charge to set at liberty them that are bound. The charge and go teach all nations. The charge to baptize those who you taught. Tabitha took up the charge. She didn't just cheer her brothers. She didn't just cheer for Jesus. She wasn't just a fan of Jesus. But she took up the challenge to follow him. One of the church's greatest issues is that Jesus has too many cheerleaders and not enough folks taking up the charge. I've told you before, we love, oh, sweet baby Jesus. We love him. We love him. We love him wrapped in swaddling clothes. We love him laying in a manger. We love talking about how there was no room for him in the end. Yeah. Yeah. We, we love talking about Jesus being Mary's baby, and we love him as the Lion of Judah. But, but we don't like Jesus hanging on that old raggedy cross. We, we don't like him with nail-scarred hands and, and battered and bruised up feet and thorns in the crown of his head. We, we will cheer him as, as long as he's doing something that we like him to do. But there's too many cheerleaders and not enough folks who have taken up the charge. See, fans will cheer as long as the team is winning, as long as the scoreboard is in your favor. But as soon as the score shifts, we no longer cheer. See, church folks will cheer the great work. We'll cheer for Jesus on Sunday. We'll cheer through our music and melodies. We'll cheer when stuff sounds good to us. We'll cheer when a message tickles our ears. But we fall short when it's time to take up the charge. See, the charge makes your shout have substance. The charge is to praise and to protest. And the truth is that you haven't taken up the charge, then you might as well stop all the cheering. Uh, see, God doesn't need any cheerleaders. Uh, he doesn't need any more folk who only show up to get something from him. He doesn't need any more folk who come to church but are not being the church. Uh, we need folks who are going to take up the charge with your life. Dr. Nelson Price, the former pastor of the Roswell Street Baptist Church in Cobb County, Georgia, he wanted to place his church's television ministry in the most un unchurched counties in America. He contacted the research department of his denomination and asked them to give him a list of the most unchurched counties in America. To his astonishment, one of those counties was the county where his church was, uh, Cobb County, Georgia, uh, the county his church was located in. Uh, it was a mistake to believe that the lost are out there uh, in most cases is the lost folk are sitting right in the church. There are folk who've been good church members who really don't know who Jesus is. Stop trying to go all over the world telling people about the Lord and why don't you try starting on your pew or starting in your backyard or starting at your job or starting in your school. The charge is to be a witness first in your house until all of your children know Jesus. Until your husband or wife know the Lord, then that's your charge. Until your whole family is connected, that's your charge. Until Cleveland has God's victory that is our charge 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 we got to take up 
take up, take up the charge. See, some folk don't value human life. We got to have take up the charge. We need politicians who are guided by moral compass, not by their money and their purse. We need the charge. Our social order is disrespectful to our seniors. We need to take up the charge. We are so consumer focused that we don't own anything. We don't sell anything. We don't leave anything. All because we're so focused on buying something that somebody else owns and makes, sells and profits from. We need the charge from God. Secondly, secondly, not only do fans complain and, and cheer, and, uh, but followers take up the charge. But secondly, fans look for public performance. But followers are seeking God's presence. Fans are looking for public performance, but followers are seeking God's presence. See, fans want it to look good on paper. There, there's a new industry in punditry that is a multi-billion dollar industry in football. It is called draft assessment. Fans, as fans, we like to look at the picks. Who, 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 who are they going to pick? Who we got 13 picks in the draft. We, we, we got 13 picks in the draft this year. Who, who are we going to pick with that number one? The Browns got the number one and the number four pick in this year's, this year's draft. Who are we going to pick in the number one? How, some of you on your phone right now, you can scroll. If you click onto your internet service and I look through your history, I will see a listing of all of the scouts, scouts.com, Inc., and 247 Sports of you thinking and imagining who the Brown, what quarterback the Browns might take with that first pick in the draft. Uh, we, we, it's a whole billion dollar industry. See, fans like to look at the picks. Folk who haven't played a down in the NFL and we determine if they, you got a good or bad draft based on what it looks like on paper. Oh, look like they got some good ones this year. Look, look like they got some good people coming in. But it's March. They ain't played no football. They haven't been in the league. And the church has this same problem. See, some folk wanted to look good in public, to look like it's doing good, to look like it's God's church. But that's as far as we'll go is how it looks. As long as it looks good on paper, I ain't got to change my life. But that's not God's way. Tabitha did not choose activities that would get her recognition and trophies. She was found hanging out with folk who were powerless. She wasn't interested in performance, but her service was all about looking for God's presence. Uh, see, a fan is only interested in what you can do for them. Uh, a fan is all right as long as the performance is good. Uh, but when you strike a sour note, uh, when you miss that free throw, uh, when you fumble that ball, uh, they remind you that it's only about your performance. The text calls Tabitha a disciple because she sought after God's presence. His presence was the power for her ministry. His presence was the push behind her gifts. His presence was the strength for her journey. His presence kept her in perfect peace. His presence propelled her to new heights in ministry. His presence challenged the status quo. His presence got her access. His presence gave her influence, followers to seek after God's presence. We, we, we got to stop trying to live as if life and coming to church is only meant to entertain us based on our palate, to soothe us, to make us feel better. Giving that church golf clap and wry smile. Uh, if the choir or the preacher has massaged your ears or disrupted your day, huh? we ought to be coming to church to be empowered, enlightened, inspired, agitated, uplifted, and upset. Huh? My soul makes her boast, not in my monuments to myself, huh? but my soul makes her boast in the Lord. Huh? The humble here that and get glad about the presence of God. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. You got to be empowered to go in Jesus name. Empowered to do justly and love mercy. Empowered to walk in the presence of God. See, fans are looking for performance. Fans follow Janet Jackson's mantra. Y'all know, I know you're not, you're not that safe. You know Janet Jackson. You know what she said. What have you done Oh, yeah, some of y'all be, some of y'all know, some of y'all tripping and acting like you don't know it. I think the whole church ought to say, what have you done for me lately? What? And if, and if lately you think God is in blessing you, lately you think that life has hit some rough spots, lately things haven't been done like you like them, life hasn't gone the way you like, we like to kick God to the curb until we feel like God is back blessing us again. Looking for God to perform for us. The problem with looking for performance is that performance is not a participatory activity. When you're always looking at performance, then you only show up to get something and you never show up to give anything. Uh, but when you seek God's presence, uh, you discover that you got to give all that you are uh, and all that you have. Uh, parenthetically, you do understand the only thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them uh, was how to pray. Uh, and Jesus didn't hold a prayer meeting. Uh, he didn't hold a 
prayer training. He just said a prayer. And the truth is that we got to learn how to live with God and in God by really trusting who God is. You can't be taught how to trust God. You can't be taught how to love your neighbor. The disciples picked up what they picked up, not because they had a class, but because they had been walking with Jesus himself. So you got to learn how to trust him by actually trusting him. You got to learn how to love him by actually loving him. And you ain't got to tell me if you're walking with God. You ain't got to tell me what Bible verses you know. I already know it by how you live your life. I already know. You ain't got to tell me. You don't have to tell me what your favorite scripture is. I can see it by how you live. I can see it by how you smile. You, you don't have to tell me what's Bible versus you love. I can see it all over your face all over your life you got to seek his presence speaking to a large audience D.L. Moody the great evangelist he held up an empty glass and he asked the class he said how do I get air out of this glass it's empty glass empty glass full of air one one man shouted you you can suck it out with a vacuum uh, Moody replied that would create a larger vacuum and it would shatter the glass so the glass would break if you did it like that. After numerous suggestions, Moody smiled. He started laughing. He picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass with water. He, he, he said, there, he said, now all the air is removed. The purpose of the demonstration, he explained, was that victory in this life of faith is not accomplished by sucking out a sin here and there, but it's accomplished by being filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. See, God fills you and gives you hope. He fills you and gives you joy. He fills you and changes your song. And you do know, church folk, that every believer, every person sitting in here, you ought to have a song in your soul. Soul, uh, that stirs you and helps you to be aware of the presence and the power of God. Uh, see, life is hard living uh, if you don't have a song. Uh, I'm not talking about a song that the choir sings. Uh, I'm not talking about a song uh, that you hear on the radio. Uh, those are all right, but you need a song down in your soul uh, that your heart will sing uh, and makes your soul make the melody. Uh, you're not a victim of the vices uh, when you see God's presence. Uh, you're not just a fan uh, when you see God's presence. Uh, you can't leave here the same way you showed up when you see God's presence. Uh, you can't stay the same week after week. When you see God's presence, you got to learn to live and seek after God's presence. Fans complain and cheer. Followers take up the charge. Fans want performance, public performance. Followers seek his presence. And the last, last thing I want to share with you this morning is fans will walk out on you. Fans will walk out on you, but followers walk in and work. Fans will leave you. They'll kick you to the curb, but followers will walk in on you and work work with you. In God's out-of-the-box kingdom, we show up to church not to get something, but we show up to give something. You show up to give your service, to give your gifts, to give your love, to give your worship. It isn't about you. It's about the presence of God. Tabitha walked into a religious tradition that isolated her because she was a woman. She took on a culture that denied her full access all because she walked in and worked for the Lord uh, see fans I know because I am a fan uh, will walk out on you uh, if you ain't doing stuff for them they'll boo you and turn on you in a minute uh, they'll turn on you like you never did anything to please them y'all watched the Cavs last night uh, you heard at halftime the fans booing them as they walked off the court uh, oh Cleveland we had we hadn't had a championship in over 50 years uh, and the Cavs bring a championship just two years ago to the city uh, and all of a sudden because uh, they're having a bad game or having bad season or doesn't look like we wanted to look we booing them on the way out the stadium yeah we walk out on them they'll turn on you and we'll find another team to support they will turn on you and refuse to support the team my mama kicked Washington to the curb a long time ago and went to Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh was doing more winning she kicked them to the curb she walked out on the on Washington but but I like Tabitha I like her because she wasn't just a fan she was a follower who decided that against all odds, I'm going to walk in and work for the Lord. I don't care what you say to me or what you do to me. When the brothers tried to isolate her, she walked in and worked for the Lord. When they told her she couldn't do that, she walked in and worked for the Lord. She worked doing good deeds. She worked bringing good news. She worked to challenge the system. She worked to love her neighbor. She worked to lift the low. The Bible says Tabitha worked, y'all. She, 
She reminds me of our, our foreparents, our, our ancestors. Tabitha really reminds me of our ancestors. Let, let me remind you uh, uh, just a little bit about our ancestors. You do know we've always been a spiritual people tied to the land, uh, but also tuned to the whispering winds of eternity. See, our native religions uh, were characterized by warmth, sincerity, relevance, and, and total reverence for God and for all life. Uh, and so when we hooked our religion up and to the risen Jesus, we were not only to receive this Christianity, but we were able to transform it. Uh, when the slave master taught us his version of Christianity, uh, instead of walking out on it, uh, we took it in and filtered it through our own experience uh, and restored it to the New Testament signature of universal love. Uh, you do know our ancestors uh, took stiff and stilted, uh, grandiloquent and magniloquent hymns, uh, and we turned them into spiritual melodies uh, and harmonies of the heart. Uh, we took a dry rotted religion uh, that was just in your head, uh, a religion that made somebody more than somebody else, uh, a dry stale religion of the head, uh, and we made it over into a lively religion of the heart and freed your soul. Uh, we were, y'all. Uh, we had only heard from others uh, that the Bible says, uh, slaves obey your master, uh, but when we learned to read for ourselves, uh, we discovered where to read uh, and what to read. Uh, we turned over to Exodus uh, and read to the master that God told Moses uh, to tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Uh, and then we flipped over to Isaiah 58 where God told the prophet to tell him undo my heavy burdens, uh, set the captive free uh, and break every yoke. Uh, we'd heard that we were to live life on the plantation of suffering and shame, uh, but we worked and found John's gospel uh, where Jesus said, I have come uh, that you might have life uh, and have that life more abundantly. We are a working people, y'all. We work. We work. <laughs> Slave masters took the Bible and beat us over the head with it. But, but we worked and took it off our heads and put it in our hearts and used it to glorify God, bless humanity, and set all of God's people free. We worked. But now, now church, we got we gotta so, so successful. And we become so assimilated into our own way of life, so focused on our individual accomplishments, profiles, on our portfolios that we've turned skeptical. We're now sophisticated. We've been alienated. We're individualistic, materialistic, Reaganistic, blasé, and bourgeois. But some of us have walked out. We've walked out on God. We've walked out on the church. we walked out on the hungry and the hurting, walked out on the limping and the lowly, walked out on the left out, walked out on the single mother, the incarcerated father, walked out on our human decency, walked out on our faith and hope, walked out on our unity and love. I know we can stand failure and still work. The question God has for you today, because we have a long history uh, of dealing with failure and bouncing back. The record is clear that we can make meals out of mess. That we can take whole guts and make chitlins. That we can take day old bread and make, make, make bread pudding. That, that, that we can take, take hog head and make cheese, something called hog head cheese. We can take blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, grapes, and make jams and jellies that, that, that you couldn't get, you know, you, you make you want to slap somebody when, when you eat them. I know we can do that. We can build bridges with bare hands. We can make monuments out of molehills. We got a long history of dancing with no music, making do with nothing, stretching pennies into nickels and nickels into dimes and dimes into dollars. We know how to bounce back. But the question is, can you stand success? And still serve God with the same fervor and vigor that you served him with when, when you had nothing. We, Tabitha walked in and worked because she was a follower of God. Followers don't walk out on you no matter what the circumstance. But they walk in and work for the Lord until working for the Lord, you can't do it no more few missionaries or they were talking to each other and I'm almost done and the conversation was overheard by a group of pastors in the other room they could be heard saying I wish I was a doctor because if I was a doctor I would heal all the sick people that were trying to minister to now another one said I wish I wish I was a farmer because if I was a farmer I would grow rice and corn and give to all the hungry people we're serving I, I, I would teach people how to take care of the land he said yeah I would grow it and I would teach it and then another one said I wish I was an engineer and I would dig wells so every person could have the cleanest water they could have I would build it and teach it but alas I'm not a doctor or a farmer or an engineer I'm only myself but Lord here I am and I'm ready to work. Use me. I'm after hearing this. A group of pastors were overheard in the next room singing, uh, Yes, Lord. Y you know the song. Yes. 
Yes, they were singing that in the next room. A visitor asked them, it's asked them, well, it hears like it, the answer is yes. They said, well, what's the question, pastors? What, what's the question? The answer is yes. You're saying yes, Lord. What, what's the question? They responded, it doesn't matter. As long as God is asking the question, then the answer, my answer has got to be yes. And the truth of the matter is that your work must start and end with yes to the Lord. Uh, yes, I'll work to serve others. Yes, I'll help somebody. Yes, I'll lift somebody. Yes, I'll love somebody. Yes, I'll use my gifts. Yes, I'll love my neighbor. We'll hit your house in a minute. Yes, I'll give God glory. Yes, I'm going to be out of the box. Yes, I'll let justice roll. Yes, I'll set the example. Yes, I'll challenge injustice. Yes, I'll fight intolerance. Yes, I'll love you. Yes. I'll like you, yes. I'll lead you, yes. I'll serve with you, yes. I'll smile more, yes. I'll be at church, yes. Do I have seven friends in here who are willing to give God a yes? I'll work to organize. I'll work to strategize. My soul says, says yes. And the reason, the reason, and I'm done, I'm done. I said I was going to try to be calm today. The reason, the reason, though, I, I, I'm, the reason I, I got to be a follower is because you do know God. God never, despite the fact that sometimes we kick God to the curb, sometimes we walk out on God, sometimes we act like we don't know who God is. I, I, I got to be, I got to be a follower because God never gives up on us. Shh, keep that to yourself. Don't tell nobody that. I, I want you to keep that. That stays within these doors here uh, of the church. Listen, shh, shh, God never gives up on us. Never, ever. He never has given up on us. Even though, even though all through our history, we, 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 God, we have failed God and failed humanity. All through our history, every person that God ever depended on to build a brave new world, they failed miserably. He said, Pastor, what are you talking about? Let me, let me call the class roll for you. Let me. Let me call the class roll because because some new students have showed up. Some new students have showed up to class. You, you know, Jacob cheated. David had an affair. Isaac, they dreamed all the time. Samson was a philanderer. Noah got drunk and naked. Jonah was prejudiced. Moses committed murder. Gideon was insecure. Jehoshaphat was too anxious. Haggai was materialistic. Malachi was indifferent. Elijah was moody. Miriam gossiped. Martha worried. Peter had a temper. Thomas doubted. All disappointed the occasion. And everybody has let God down. But guess what? God, God wouldn't give up. God wouldn't be outdone. God said, since I can't send anybody, I'll go myself. And, and since I can't find nobody to do what I want done, I'm going to do it myself. God took up the charge and God went to work. So God lowered God uh, and gave him a name. Uh, Y'all do know the name, don't you? Uh, a name that's above every name. Uh, a name that makes every knee bow uh, and every tongue confess. Uh, does anybody here know that name? Uh, Y'all don't fool me now. Uh, some call him Emmanuel. Uh, some call him Prince of Peace. Uh, some call him Mary's baby. Uh, when you're hungry, you can call him bread of life. If you're thirsty, he's living water. If you're sick, he's your healer. If you're lonely, he's your best friend. If you need a way out, you can call him the way maker. And all of us need a savior, so I learned to just call him Jesus. You do know God, Lord God, through 42 generations, wrapped in human flesh, born in Bethlehem, dressed in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, baptized in a river, hated by the world, forsaken by his friends, oppressed by his enemies, uh, persecuted by the government, uh, arrested like a criminal, uh, beaten by a mob, uh, nailed to a cross, uh, wounded in the side, uh, crowned with thorns, uh, and crucified at Calvary. Uh, is there a witness here uh, that knows who I'm talking about? Uh, he died on Friday to make you holy, uh, but I'm so glad, uh, and I'm a follower, because early uh, on Sunday morning, uh, he got up with all power in his hands. Uh, is there a witness here uh, who's testimony is uh, I have decided uh, to follow Jesus uh, no turning back uh, no turning back uh, the world behind me uh, the cross before me uh, no turning back uh, no turning back I gotta follow Jesus stand with me no turning back no no don't half step on you following the world behind me, the cross before me, I ain't turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have.
decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to take up the charge. I've decided to seek his presence. And I've decided to work until God says, well done. You know, that's how long your working hours are. Your, your labor doesn't stop because you retire from your job. Your labor doesn't stop because you're five years old. There are no labor laws in the kingdom. You got to work until God says, well done. If you're eight or 108 or 58, or 28 or 38 or 48 or 68, 78, 88, 98. I'll hit you in a minute. You in one of them decades. You got to work. You got to work and serve and love God with everything you have until you hear him say, well done. Well done. I don't want to rust out. Where I, I've rust out because of inactivity. I want to wear out. I've done all that I can do for God to the point. He just says, well done. Will you stand with me all over God's house?